real official episode of What the Fat. And none other than my friend, brother, mentor, the guy who's literally took me under his wing and gave me everything that I have today. I have with us a very, very special guest, and that is Dr. Jacob Wilson. Welcome to the show. Thanks, Ryan. Super pumped up to be on the show today. Um, this is like a, it's always a dream to, to, to do this with you. It really is. And, um, let's do it. Dude, I'm excited, man. So we, we had done a little podcasting before, but I think this new relaunch is going to take it to a whole nother level because we want to provide people value and information in a short time that they could w- listen to on the way to the work or whatever in between while they're working out, things like that. And I think we got a lot of cool stuff lined up today. We do a hundred percent. So the first thing I want to ask you, because you and I have, we've been through war together, man. We have been through war. <laughs> we've been we're through gonna war. We're going to write a book one day. One day we're going to write a book, other than the ketogenic bio, we're going to come out yeah. with the life story yeah. of uh, of Doc. Yeah, I guess we already have our first book together. We so. do, we do. <laughs> but we'll have a life book. <laughs> so this one's a, a, an interesting topic and something that is very relevant to today. I mean, you see it all the time, unfortunately, in middle school and in high school school and due to the social media age uh, you even see it in adults now Um, and that is how do we deal with haters because you and I I mean we've been doing research for a long time now and of course anytime you start doing things you're going to get people that reach out and and want to hate on it so I want to get your perspective what's your thought on dealing with haters well that's a really good question and I think first moving back to like the the kids days there's a lot of kids out there get bullied um, and you're, or kids who don't get picked for a team or something like that. And a lot of what's causing it is social pressures. You're out on the playground, there's several kids, it's unregulated, and they can say whatever they want. Now, as they grow up, they learn that you shouldn't call a kid stupid or an adult stupid. But social media has changed things. And in fact, studies have actually shown on social media that the social pressures and how it's not regulated actually makes adults act like kids. And it's actually super interesting, and I think it's definitely causing a lot of problems in our society. As far as haters, I think it's really taking a meta perspective. One thing that I've learned, Ryan and I I both learned this, is that like when you do something new, when you do something that people have never seen before, they don't understand, it kind of goes against their sense of reality. And anytime you disrupt someone's sense of reality – they may tend to fight back because just psychologically you want to go back into balance. Like if you look at keto keto dieting, for years everyone said that low fat was the way to go. Now right. we're saying eat high fat foods, eat low carb. It goes against a reality so people are automatically hit back. And in our lives, everything we've done has always been disruptive. And so with that, you could say fortunately or unfortunately, is going to come people fighting against their own personal reality, and they're going to attack out. Personally, it's I, I've learned it. at first it's, it was difficult, and then I really took a meta perspective and said, that's just their coping mechanism. You know what I mean? And my response typically is to help more people in response to whenever someone hates me for every one person who's a hater, one, I'll try and help them. But I'll try and help 10 more people for every hater that there is in hopes that maybe one day they'll be able to change. I love that. And I think the biggest key, you hit the nail on the head, is taking this meta perspective. And really, life's dictated by perspective. So oftentimes, like we get it a lot, you get it on social media and things like that, where people will reach out. And the first thing I'll do when I hear that from someone, if they're like, hey, I hate your research or you're dumb, you're stupid or something like that, I'll reach out. And the first thing I'll say is, hey, I'm sorry you feel that way. Uh, Is there anything I can do to help? Or are you okay? Mm. Like literally coming from a a perspective of empathy, because if you have time in your life to really hate on someone else, there's clearly something wrong with you. And I just got back from New Jersey and I was giving a talk to a group of high schoolers. And one of the things that I I told the teacher, and she's like, I'm going to hang this on my walls, hurt people, hurt people. And if you think about it, like people that are hurt, try and hurt others. And so if you think about that from a hurt people, hurt people, 
you literally reach out when they ha- when that happens and you go like is everything okay and oftentimes these people these people who are quote unquote haters or trolls whatever you call them they'll go silent or sometimes which you can really offer a helping hand they'll come out and be like you know what like things are just rough right now i'm sorry and a lot of times they apologize versus trying to get into an argument cuz you're never it's never going to win you're never going to win that argument of battling head to head over and over again cuz they're always going to bring something up and one of the thing, one of my favorite quotes of all time that we talk about is haters will see you walk on water and say it's because you can't swim. Exactly. I, I exactly. mean, they're always, there's, it doesn't matter favorite. what you do. They're always going to bring something up. It really doesn't matter. So, so I think repaying the hate with kindness is a good way to go. Right. And see, and, and kind of like the second point that I explained to these kids is looking at it from a different perspective of we're so focused, focused on the positive that at this point, I think we're at a stage in our careers that anyone could say anything. Like, it doesn't matter what gets said because all we need to focus on is the one story or the thousands and hundreds of thousands of stories of the positive people who come in and say, you changed my life. Like that's what I, anytime someone comes in and goes, I hate you. I'm like, I'm sorry you feel that way. Is there any way I can help? I'm so focused on the positive that none of that can ever, ever affect me. hundred percent. I hundred percent agree. So what do, what can you, if you had to give advice to kids coming up or researchers that are in our field, kids that are just graduating from college and wanting to get into not only our field, but I mean the fitness, nutrition space in general is pretty harsh. So what kind of advice would you give to those kids? Well, first off, it is very difficult to get into this field. In fact, yesterday we were having a conversation of how difficult it is to A, be in this field and even be an entrepreneur in this field is becoming more and more difficult. Um, what I'm going to say is this is that um, first you need to have the skills and competencies, and we always talk about that. So there's a reason why, like, you know, I watch, Ryan knows, I watch your Instagram lives <laughs> and have my comments on there. But w- if you go, Ryan's getting 100 questions uh, um, a minute coming at him, but he can answer them rapid fire. That took hours and hours of practice and study. So if you look even like now, like when I wake up in the morning, my first couple hours are study still. So I try and when I'm not when I'm not being bothered, when I'm not at work, when I'm not in meetings, first thing I do when I wake up is I study. So constantly studying. And before even ASPI, when we were full time research, um, we actually literally that's what we did 24 seven. We study 24-7, and it's uh, it, that's the number one thing I would say that you want to do. Now, number two is you're going to want to find a really good mentor. That's really, really important, and with that mentor, take the long game, okay? So you want to come in and realize, like, Ryan and I didn't just get here. Like, Aspie's here, but we've been working on this for a, a decade, right? And so that's the number one thing is that you find a mentor, you find someone you can work with and be willing to sacrifice to work with this person. Like you got to take the long game. That's what Ryan did. He took the long game. Now he's a successful entrepreneur, um, owns several businesses, and it's growing rapidly. Uh, um, has his doctorate, but it didn't just happen overnight. So that's the, that's the third thing is, like I said, the long game. Be willing to sacrifice. Um, it's not... It's not going to happen today. It's going to take time. It's going to take years, and that's fine. It doesn't need to happen like right now. It's every single day putting in the work. Um, the other thing is, I find being um, emotionally agile is very important. Very important. Mm-hmm. You're going to get hit and smacked with a lot of shit, like in your career, a lot. There's going to be times where you're like, "Why am I doing this?" Right. But that's when you need to really have good friends around you that you can talk with. That's when you need to be able to take a meta perspective. And when we mean that, we mean like be able to step outside of yourself and sit and look down and go, where am I at my career? How have I progressed? What moves do I need to make next? That's taking a meta perspective, which will take you out of a negative emotional state. You know, those are some of the tips that I have. And then, of course, like I said, and I mentioned this, good friends. Right. 
good friend. And and I like to kind of building off that, look at it as do a proximity check. Like look at your circle around you. Look at who you're spending most of your time with. Like that saying about the five people, you, like that's real. Yeah. That shit's real. Like the people you spend time with, the people you surround yourself with, they matter. Um, and it's funny because I look at now, like I don't go on Facebook as much anymore, but I should because um, – but Instagram even has an algorithm as well. But all of these social media platforms are starting to build algorithms. And it's amazing when I go on them. Like, I don't see any of that shit anymore. Like, it's pure positivity. Like, people who are posting good stuff. Sometimes it's cats from you. Like, it's yeah. it's all, it's all yeah, great yeah. stuff. It's stuff that I want to be surrounded with. But, like, social media, if you if you attract that stuff, like, if you can, you can literally use it for the positive. Unfortunately, a lot of times it gets used for the negative and people sit behind computer screens and try and beat other people up on it, which is horrible. But if you surround yourself and like the pages you like, the stuff you're interacting with, the people you're following, like I follow a very select few few people and I've unfollowed a lot of people that have caught that are negative. I don't need that in my life. It comes in, it permeates and just it's not what I want. So yeah. I get rid of it. I agree. Well, actually, I, one, I was on the airplane with one of my friends and he said, hey, you know, so and so has been talking. They've, they've both been saying so many bad things about you why don't you just like spend time like trying to you know uh get them to change i'm like and i said i'm just i don't have time for that you know what i mean like i'm gonna spend time on things that are positive and actually like my instagram account it really is all positive it's and cats. very rare <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah cats of the week <laughs> but it's really all positive because yeah. that's how it's really set up and even when so like last week i had someone who came on my page and he literally they're he he had like ten comments on the post. The post was basically that you don't need carbs post workout to be anabolic. <laughs> and this guy came and goes, "That's false. This is false. I can't believe you said that." And those were all his comments. And I just responded and said, "Hey, you know what? One, I really appreciate the fact that you take this much time on my post. That you're following muscle PhD. It, re- it means a lot, even though you disagree with what I said." And then he came down and he was actually positive after that. Right. And so it's like by surrounding yourself with positive people, you can change things. Uh, you know Andy Frisella, one of our good friends. Great dude, yeah. Um, uh, he's an amazing guy. Really cool cars, uh, mm-hmm. and great businessman. Started with nothing, was in debt. You know, with like one nutrition store out in St. Louis. Everyone called him crazy. Now he's got a massive brand. He's crushing it. Um, he's just and he's a what he did actually recently was. Everyone who he, who he saw a negative comment from, like on his feed, he deleted them for like a week. Brilliant. Brilliant. And now he doesn't have that in his in his life. And I do think surrounding yourself with super positive people is very, very important. Good guy in our facility um, who's actually, I think, doing a great job of all of this is Paul. Mm-hmm. Paul Hauser. He does like our marketing and stuff like that. There's been a lot of negative stuff that's happened, um, you know, but a lot of positive also over the last three years. And Paul every day stays positive and he sacrifices, but he's told me several times, like, it's all about being around positive people. And you see him growing every single day and every single way. And he's going to, he's going to get anything, you know, he'll, he'll reach any goal that he puts his mind to. Undoubtedly. And so I think the take home here is that it's infectious. It really, the environment that you surround yourself with is infectious. And you're going to, no matter what you're doing, if you're making waves, there's going to be people who, I call them cockroaches, who come out of the closet. They they wait until it's dark Mm -hmm. and then they climb out and they try and cause a whole bunch of stir. But there's always going to be that. But you have to focus on the positive and understand hurt people hurt people. Those people are hurting deep down inside. So reach out with a sense of empathy and say, hey, sorry to hear that you feel that way. Is there anything I can do to help? And well, that literally puts them, put, shuts, shuts the whole thing down. A hundred percent. And I don't, what most, a lot of times people see and they see Aspen, they see millions of dollars worth of equipment. And like they see huge things happening here. Like um, next month we're having Randy Moss and like the top 10 wide receivers in the world coming through Aspie. We got Tony Robbins coming here. Literally people from all around the world coming. But three years ago, Ryan and I stepped out of academics. And we had built um, a multi-million dollar lab. And we left that all behind. And we stepped out of academics. And while we were designing ASPI, we did it right out of my, 
my home, right? The ranch. We call it the ranch. Is myself, Ryan, and um, our business partner, uh, Sam Beeler. Literally worked hours on end. But at that time, we had nothing. There was no ASPI. Uh, there was no ketogenic.com. It was a, it was a thought. And while we were working, uh, kind of in the dark, with you know, without any lab, at that time, all those cockroaches kind of came out, and we got attacked like crazy. I mean, people were saying horrible things, like, you know what, like, just you'll never make it. You're done. You're through. And now we have a lab and facility that's literally twenty times larger than our old one. Mm-hmm. Um, that has. 10, 10, 20 times more technology than our old laboratory had. And what happened was I can remember that like we, there's, it was dent, a density of attacks and you had, still have that little video. And we made a statement that like, you know, we we're leaving here and there could be a lot of animosity. But we're actually leaving with gratitude um, and hope and strength for our future so that we can go out and touch more lives and even now, that's our goal. And talking about all this bullying and haters and stuff like that, one of the charities that we want to do in the future that we're working toward mm. is Bully to Beast, where we take kids that are bullied and uh, bring them into ASPI and turn them into beasts. So, we're going to make that uh, happen, man. We're going to make it happen. So I love it. So I think the take-home point for this segment is this, guys. Uh, you're always going to have people in your life that try and drag you down. Check your circle. Check who your your proximity. Check who's around you. Focus on the positive. Make sure that that circle is filled with positive people that don't bring you down but lift you up and make you a better person. So I want to switch gears a little bit, brother. I want to switch gears and go into a topic that we've all we've all we've been interested in for a long time. We've published studies on it. Our colleagues have published studies on it, and that is can you gain muscle on a ketogenic diet? So a lot of people think, hey, I need insulin, I need carbohydrates, like after my workout, I need to slug down some carbs with some protein or to make sure I'm blunting that that protein breakdown and I'm triggering protein synthesis or muscle building. Is it true? Can you gain muscle on a ketogenic diet? <clears throat> well, in short, can you gain muscle on a ketogenic diet? The answer is yes. You definitely can gain muscle on a ketogenic diet. Now, fast uh, or rind, like several years ago, Ryan Lowry and I found ourselves um, at a conference, and it was a National Strength Conditioning Association conference. And by the way, that was one of our probably our one of our peaks of academics. Yeah. We were National Strength Conditioning, and I think that year um, Ryan won a Presenter of the Year award that year, um, and I got the Young Investigator of the Year award. We were cranking out studies. We were doing like, shoot, six studies a semester. I mean, it was it was nuts. We were publishing two, three papers a month. Like it, it was in. We were literally in the zone, like um, NBA Jam style. We go to this conference, and at the time, our a lot of research we were doing was blood flow restriction training, uh, different dieting strategies, and we saw Jeff Volick and Steve Finney. And um, basically, you had the audience come up and they asked a question. It was a very impactful question. The question was what? Uh, what happens? Can you gain muscle on Can a ketogenic diet? Can you gain muscle on a ketogenic diet? And Jeff Bullock basically said, we don't have any studies with resistance training. And, and so Ryan and I looked at each other and said immediately, looks like we got a lot of work to do. And we did. We put a lot of work in. And um, in fact, that was one of our, we initiated one of our first studies on ketogenic dieting, um, which was essentially, um, it was a 10 week study. Um, and we essentially had individuals, uh, keto adapt. So we adapted these individuals for, uh, a couple weeks, like two weeks. And then we put them on a hardcore training protocol for several weeks against people who had been carb adapted their whole lives. Right, and the training program was difficult. It wasn't Very like, difficult. A, like, hey, here's your training program. We'll see in 10 weeks. Like, we monitored these We people. monitored them. We trained them. And by the way, that doesn't happen much. Mm-hmm. Most of the times when you do studies, people will say, hey, here's a workout program. Go train. <laughs> and you wonder why you don't see anything, right? But we trained them. We trained them hard. And they gained as much muscle on the ketogenic diet as the carbohydrate group. And in fact, during that keto period, they lost more fat. 
So basically, yes, you can gain as much muscle. Uh, you can gain muscle on a ketogenic diet. In our study, these are advanced individuals. They gained as much muscle as those who were on a carbohydrate diet. So that was one of the first studies we did. And by the way, that was like a, that paper got probably more press out of any NSDA paper out of uh, th- that whole year, I'd say. Yeah. It, it got a lot of attention. And, you know, it was really a breakthrough and shift in people's minds that I thought you, you like you don't need carbohydrates to gain muscle. And yeah. this was kind of like, like people were kind of confused and shocked over this mm-hmm. idea that you didn't need carbohydrates. But if you look back at even like Paoli, our colleague yeah. out of Italy, like you look at some of his work in elite gymnasts and granted the biggest thing that people pick apart from his study is cool. They had more protein in the ketogenic, the low carb ketogenic dieting group than the other condition, but they were still able to improve their body composition and maintain their strength, which for gymna- gymnasts is huge. And then mm-hmm. we followed up on that really with the first ever well-controlled resistance training study and saw yeah. the same thing. We saw the same exact thing. So, Bottom line is, yes, you can gain muscle on a ketogenic diet. And we followed that up with more studies. We looked we looked at the molecular level. And and we want to talk a little bit about what we found mechanistically on how that's possible? Yeah. So we looked at, we looked actually at the molecular level, and we looked um, at can muscle synthesize as much protein as you can on a keto versus not ketogenic diet. So protein synthesis, think about it, you have your muscle, you have like uh, amino acids that are broken down from protein floating around in your body. And those basically protein synthesis, your muscle takes those amino acids and turns them into muscle. That's protein synthesis. It's, a, it's muscle growth on a micro scale. And basically we found that when you actually uh, were in a ketogenic diet, you could simulate protein synthesis as much as not a ketogenic diet. But here's the kicker. We looked at giving, like, forget the ketogenic diet and everything like that. We looked at actually giving ketones. Are ketones themselves anabolic? And um, we actually found that ketones themselves could trigger protein synthesis. So for us, this is saying that ketogenic diet, not you gain muscle, but ketones themselves actually may trigger that response. So this is fascinating because people want to wonder how, how is this possible? Not only can ketones trigger muscle protein synthesis, but ketones also spare the breakdown, like you mentioned, of a very important amino acid, leucine, Mm -hmm. which is the primary amino acid responsible for driving that muscle protein synthesis response. So you literally have a benefit from the synthesis side of triggering muscle growth by itself and potentially reducing muscle protein breakdown um, and, and keeping that response on. So it, there's a lot to be done here, but there's clearly mechanisms of why this may be feasible, and, and clearly we've seen it. Well, that's super cool because the thing is if you look at people who are trying to gain muscle, they're always trying to have very, very high protein levels. Um, but the thing is when you're in a ketogenic state, technically you might be sparing protein from being broken down. So maybe you can have that moderate amount of protein like you have, like you talk about on ketogenic.com and get the same responses if you had 50% more protein. And this is a study that needs to be done. I don't know if we need to do it or someone needs to do this because typically in the literature (laughs) you see anywhere from 20 to 30 grams of a high quality protein maximally stimulating uh, muscle protein synthesis. In elderly individuals, that's a little bit more. But I'm curious, and I know we've talked about this, is if you're in a ketogenic state, could you get away with less? Like, could this be something where people who are elderly typically need how much? And if they're not keto adapted, how many grams of protein would they need to trigger? Per, per a meal? I think they need meal. 30 to 40 grams. 30 to 40 grams. But like, if I tell my grandpa to try and eat 30 to 40 grams, it's unlikely. Like, happen. he's probably eating way less than not I would happen. eat at 20 to 30 grams. So... My question is, if someone's elderly and they're in a ketogenic state, could they get away with triggering and holding on and preserving some of that muscle, preventing what we call sarcopenia or age-related muscle loss? Could they prevent some of that at a lower dosage of protein if they're in a ketogenic state? Well, here's some very interesting stuff. So back in grad school, that was my main focus was sarcopenia. And we had this very paradoxical, interesting thing that we saw. There is a researcher, actually, she did this research like 17 years ago, 17 to 19 years ago, but she had a landmark study in 2001. Uh, Her name was uh, Elena Volpe, and Volpe did research. She took elderly people. 
she gave them protein and saw protein synthesis went up, right? She then took that protein and combined it with carbs. Protein synthesis was lower. Interesting. In other words, carbohydrates were blunting the protein synthesis response. And what happens is, one of the reasons why we think we don't stimulate as much protein synthesis with age is that we become insulin resistant. So protein synthesis, when you eat a meal, the protein triggers protein synthesis, but also meals stimulate blood flow toward muscle. When you're insulin resistant, that response doesn't happen. And so you actually don't, um, you actually, what happens is you actually don't trigger that response. So one thing is that elderly may be more anabolic just by lowering their carbs in general. Then two, the long-term effects that they have improved insulin sensitivity and maybe they'll lower that threshold just because of that. Now you add on top of that, the muscle sparing effects of ketones and the insulin sensitizing effects of ketones, you may reverse a lot of that condition fascinating we're gonna have to do an entire segment on some of the anti-aging stuff that we've talked about with ketogenic diet that stuff's absolutely fascinating um but since we've done our study uh we we've seen we saw that incredible results since we've done that we've seen more studies now kind of replicate and see the same thing i mean our colleague rachel gregory who we'll have on the podcast at some point she saw it in crossfit athletes they were able to improve their body composition maintain their strength our friends out of auburn university dr mike roberts and and his crew at auburn literally seeing the same thing and so we're seeing the and there's either even some data out of uh, australia uh, in New Zealand with elite power lifters. Like mm. People would be like, oh, no, power lifters need to have all these carbs, and they, they're slugging down all different kinds of candy and sugar just to try and get their lift. They saw in power lifters they were still able to improve their performance on a ketogenic diet to the same degree. Well, and here's the thing, right? What I don't understand is that if you look at it, for, for example, people go, oh, you need – like I remember you, – you remember when we first spoke about um, our first ketogenic talk was at like a sport nutrition conference yep. a couple of, several years ago now people were standing up in the crowd pointing fingers at us literally just pointing at us going you need glycogen you need carbs for high intensity output right well we found that in actuality one you do need glycogen but you don't need carbs exogenously to produce that glycogen. Right, and we've seen that in both an animal and human model. So mm-hmm. do you want to talk a little bit about with Dr. Roberts out of Auburn, we, we found some things with glycogen, and then obviously yep. Dr. Volek's research. So we actually found that basically um, you can synthesize carbohydrates in your muscle with having very low car- a ketogenic diet. You can resynthesize your carbohydrate source. And Jeff Volek found that people have been keto for 15 months even when you completely depleted their carb stores, could replenish carb stores as fast as people on a high carb shake with a high fat shake after they worked out. Right. So they're literally had these individuals do like a marathon. Mm-hmm. And then afterwards, they looked at muscle glycogen levels, saw that they both depleted to the same degree, mm-hmm. and then gave one group a fat shake yep. with very little carbohydrates. The keto group. And the other group, a high carb shake. And then they looked several hours after and found what? That they both replenish carbs to the same extent. Incredible. It is right? incredible. incredible. And so kind of talking mechanistically, I think we, we have a couple of different mechanisms of why this may be possible. Glycerol, potentially yeah. some, some glucogenic amino yeah. acids. What are your thoughts on that? Well, it, what we found basically is I do think that basically you, you resynthesize carbohydrates, some from what Ryan just said, glucogenic amino acids, like alanine, for example. Alanine gets turned to carbohydrates very fast. But the thing is that we saw that your BCAs, which are important for muscle growth, were spared. So it selectively takes amino acids that are good for making glucose, and the ones that aren't, it won't mess with. Um, Also, fat, you can actually take the glycerol and convert it over, uh, like Ryan said, to carbohydrates. So we think that's super cool too. Also, when you're working out, when you produce things like lactate, that gets converted back to carbohydrates very rapidly at a higher pace. Um, and you spare carbohydrates because most people don't understand even high intensity exercise, you're actually using fat still as well. You're better at using fat at higher velocities, at higher speeds than you were before. And the other thing to understand is, guys, say you go and do a sprint, 
that's anaerobic. So you may be using carbs during that sprint. Why do you think you're breathing so fast in between sprints? Because you're using your aerobic system to recover. So that's, you're probably resting when you're doing anaerobic sports more than you're actually performing. So that aerobic system is still very important, and you use fat at a higher rate than carbs when you're keto adapted to replenish the anaerobic systems. So there's a lot of things that are going on during that adaptation. So I think it's clear to say, I think we can make the clear argument that it is absolutely possible to gain muscle on a ketogenic diet. There's so many groups on Facebook, keto gains, and all these different people who are implementing strategies and seeing incredible results with both males and females implementing a well-formulated ketogenic diet and seeing tremendous results. So I think that's clear. Now, to wrap this segment up, you you are the muscle PhD. (laughs) Uh, So with that, what are some tips that people can take away from this episode if they want to start training and try and gain muscle and incorporate in a ketogenic diet? What are some quick tips you you would talk to them about? Absolutely. Well, one of the things is this. So if you're trying to gain muscle on a ketogenic diet, a lot of times people are intermittent fasting around their ketogenic diet. Try and time your your feet, your training around the times you're going to eat. I think that is important because meal frequency is much lower when you're keto. Right. You might eat one to two times a day. So that one to two times a day, try and make that most substantial meal around the workout time immediately after so you have nutrients to replenish that, that muscle. Um, the other thing is if you guys are just starting to lift weights, um, be consistent. You know, I think if you're just starting, you train two to three times a week, do two full, two to three full body workouts a week, and you're going to gain a lot of muscle just doing that in general. Constantly switch it up. That's another important tip. You know what I mean? Like don't always do the same thing. If you're a guy and you're keto and you're like, why am I not gaining muscle? Look at your training program. If you go to the gym and the first thing you do on chest is bench press every single day, then you're basically going to stop making gains. Oh, no. (laughs) (laughs) Exactly. Exactly. Switch it up. Do dumbbell bench. Do machine press. Last week, Ryan and I went and uh, actually trained in a completely different spot just so we got a novel stimulus, and we were sore the next day. So I think those are some tips that you definitely want to take home. And what about high-intensity interval training? Oh, high intensity interval training, I think is really key. So a lot of times I think people, when they're trying to change their body composition, a lot of people do start keto because they're trying to lose fat. And obviously the muscle PhD brand, the whole muscle PhD, uh, site, the whole muscle PhD Instagram is all about optimizing body composition. So that's always kind of how I do look at things. Well, people start ketogenic dieting for losing fat. And so they think I'm just going to do cardio. And then once I lose all the weight, I'll put on the muscle. Guys, I'm telling you right now, like if you do that, you just do cardio, you're going to probably lose muscle. So you need to make sure you're lifting weights as well. And in fact, studies show if you just do cardio, your metabolism will go down. Except if you're doing interval training. So interval training actually may help you build muscle and speed your metabolism. But guess what? This guy here also found that when you do interval training, it actually might increase ketosis over normal uh, steady state slow cardio. Yeah, and it burns through a ton of glycogen and you're able to hopefully adapt faster for people that are just getting started. Exactly. So guys, I think the take home for this episode is this. Uh, It is possible to gain muscle on a ketogenic diet, undoubtedly. And we've seen in our lab and it's been replicated in multiple labs Use a well-formulated ketogenic diet, incorporate in, whether you're male or female, incorporate in weights and periodize it or switch it up and absolutely make sure you're following at the muscle PhD because you provide a ton of tips and tools all the time on Instagram for how to optimize this process. So if you have any, any interest in optimizing your body composition, whether that's losing fat and or gaining muscle, is it at the muscle PhD? At the muscle PhD. Thanks, Sometimes Ryan. we get called the muscle man. It's <laughs> yeah. the, at the muscle PhD. Sometimes, yeah. <laughs> I appreciate it, brother. And so now I want to take things and switch it over. And this is kind of the last segment that people are going to hear this week is blue light. 
you and I have had long conversations about blue lights. I mean, right now it's it's pouring out, but sometimes there's important times to get blue light in when you're when during the day you want to get in some natural sunlight or or you want to get in if you're looking at your computer screen that happens usually typically during the day, but you want to kind of prevent that from happening at night. Even though you and I are workaholics and sometimes we stay up late and you're looking at your phone, sending emails, or you're looking at your computer, Talk a little bit about blue light. Talk a little bit about the importance of blocking that during the nighttime when you're trying to get to sleep and, and what some of the tips that you utilize are. Absolutely. Well, we know that in our society, sleep's a problem. Huge, huge problem. It's a huge problem. And there are theories that one of the reasons our society is so insulin resistant is because of a lack of sleep. Oh, uh, I, I absolutely believe that. Yes. Believe that. And so... In fact, studies show that uh, when you don't sleep that much, you become insulin resistant. Um, and actually, there's some studies show you become like even a normal person become show signs of being pre-diabetic when they've had a huge lack of sleep. And like you pointed out, part of that is that at night we're stimulating ourselves with television, with the computer, and most importantly with our phones. And so um, why is that – why am I bringing that up? Well, it turns out that different lights, different light strains uh, or frequencies of light trigger different responses. The blue wave frequency of light essentially triggers in our, in our bodies to be more awake. And at night, it suppresses certain things like melatonin, which make us sleepy and want to fall asleep. So if you're blocking that, you'll actually – not get the trigger to fall asleep and you may sit there and lay in bed and wonder why am i not falling asleep why am i not falling asleep so blue light does that so if you the goal is if you can block blue light you can potentially sleep more and not be as insulin resistant and so do you want to block blue light all the time or is there a certain time point like hey when at night like obviously there's certain devices that you and i have used before where like if we're exhausted or we're traveling like you kind of want to get that suppression of melatonin have you ever i mean you've worked with that in the past yes so one of the things that ryan and i do is we use these orange glasses Mm -hmm. they're like amber type glasses and they block blue light from entering you can see everything but it blocks blue light And, and studies actually show That if you have guys, say you have guys who are like this on a scale of here to here on sleep, scale 0 to 10, they're like a 9. You have another group of scale 0 to 10, they're like a 3. Studies show when you use these glasses that after like 2 to 3 weeks, those people who are at a 2 or 3 are like 9s and 10s. Which shows that like, I can't sleep, I can't sleep, I can't sleep. Maybe it's just because what you're exposed to at night. That they become actually normalized. And it, it, to me, it's added hours of sleep to my night just using those those orange glasses. Oh, it's huge. And we've been doing that for, for years now. I remember years. the first ones we did were like big and bulky. Now we use like the Swannies that are more like yeah. they look they look better. They look I can actually wear them out if I'm like going out late to grab something. Yeah. Or if I'm going to this grocery store or something, I could actually wear them out. And people, I'll still get looks, but they won't get be yeah. as bad. As exactly. Bad. Um, now going along the same time, I mean, we've, we've done stuff in the, in the morning. So say we're traveling somewhere and we get there and we're jet lagged or lay it over. Uh, there's a device that you and I have, I forget the name of it, but we'll post about it where there's sensors, not only for blue light in your eyes, but potentially like inside your ears. And there's some thoughts on like your skin as well. Like there's the opportunity where if you want blue light, like to really suppress melatonin, we have these, this device that you put into your ears or little headphones and it shines bright light uh, to really like really do the opposite of what we're talking about and suppress that melatonin. Have you noticed an effect from those of like, if we're exhausted, we just got off a plane and you want a huge exposure to that to suppress melatonin. Have you noticed anything from this? Yeah, actually that's the one thing that we've actually used that blue light therapy ourselves. Um, when we will be jet lagged, we might be jet lagged. Ryan and I will travel uh, across the country and it's a different time zone and we're jet lagged. Maybe we took a red eye and now we had to go in front of two, 3,000 people. And uh, we use the blue light therapy and boom. It's it, And in fact, studies show that in, in certain instances is better than caffeine. Right. For alert, but the difference is like with caffeine, sometimes you get tunnel visioned. So they've done studies where they've, they've had you have to respond to multiple stimuli on a board. 
Uh, but with caffeine, if you take a lot, you get tunnel visioned because your arousal is so high. This gets you alert without being tunnel visioned. So in other words, like if you're, you're ha- we need to do this before an event, we go out in front of a crowd, you're not nervous, but you're alert. That's the best way to describe it. Right. So there's two, there's, there are kind of two sides to this is at some level we can influx and do blue light therapy to suppress that melatonin. If we're going out, we're jet lagged to get in front of a crowd to, to give a presentation. But 90% of the time when we're like during the sleep time, when we're trying to go to sleep, you want to do the opposite. You want to block as much blue light as possible. And that's where those orange glasses, the swannies come into play in order to be able to block that blue light. Even because how, well, however we face it, like it, it's people are on their phones they're on the computers, they're watching TV at some level at night. We're exposed to this. There's some people, I, I was one of these people, which is horrible thinking about it growing up. I could not fall asleep up until probably college. I could not fall asleep unless the TV was on and it would run all night. And I'm like curious now. I'm to like I I wish I would have been able to measure like my sleep quality during that time. I bet it was awful mm-hmm. um, because I had so much exposure to blue light throughout the entire night. Now that's completely different. It's all blacked out. So it's all blacked out. So tell me a little bit about like your room, I guess, at, at home and like some of the habits that you do to get ready for sleep. So I have blackout curtains. Mm-hmm. I have blackout curtains that basically, so that you can't have any light doesn't come into the room. I don't have an alarm clock that where you can see any light blinking um, because that has blue light. And then I keep it very quiet, okay? Um, so I actually got like, you know, I have a high rise um, out here in Tampa. Very nice, overlooks the bay. And there's a lot of lights that can come in because literally you can see the whole city. It's a spectacular view. But I block that out at night so I can't see it. Um, and then also sounds are important too. You know, so you block blue light, but there's literally nothing coming. It is pitch black. It's so black that I could wake up in the morning or something like that. Um, you know, and I might, I never had a problem oversleeping. Okay. But, and I don't oversleep. But last night, Ryan and I and Paul, we went out. We were out a little bit late. But for the first time ever, I slept in like literally till noon. (laughs) And that hasn't happened for years. And Ryan was out on his jet ski. He's with Paul. And they text me at like 10. Hey, let's go out to the restaurant. Let's get some uh, brunch or whatever. Let's take the jet ski. And I, I didn't see it till like 12.02. I was like, what? <laughs> but I didn't even, if you looked in my room, it would have seemed that it was literally like 10 at night because right. it's so black because I have blackout curtains. And so I think that's very, very important to have. But even I think even sounds and stuff like that, I, I try to let things like disturb me at night. So like, um, you know, I'll keep it quiet as well. So what about the kids? How do you how do you get them taken care of? Yeah, so I have two cats. If you guys follow, if you do follow Muscle PhD, you have two cats, Diego and Mercedes. Okay, Diego's a big orange cat. <laughs> he has a personality like just like Garfield, and then you have Mercedes, who the only thing she ever needs is love. But the thing is, Mercedes talks. I mean, if Uncle Ryan comes to the door, she'll have a conversation with him. He'll say hi. She'll say hi back, and they'll talk. I mean, you could literally have a conversation with this girl, which is cool. But remember, and they're also brothers and sisters, so that means they they fight. You know what yeah. I mean, like and stuff <laughs> like that. So what I did was I literally instead of getting a one bedroom high rise, I got a two bedroom high rise for my sleep, and I got them their own cat room. So they have their own cat room. They got hammocks that overlook the whole city. Ryan helped me put together a huge cat tree so they can climb up into it. They got toys in there, and then they got really nice cat beds. But the point is at night, I put them in their room, and they go to sleep. But before, I couldn't sleep because they'd fight. Mercedes would talk to me all night. Of course, they might lay on my chest and groom themselves and lick themselves for an hour and a half straight (laughs) so as much as i love those guys now they have their own room and i can go to sleep and you know one of the other factors that you look at is temperature i mean i walk into this guy's place 
and I, I feel like it should be snowing. It's freezing. Yeah, it is there. freezing. He loves the cold, but I that's do. an important feat. Like a lot of people don't think about that, but sleeping in the cold as well contributes to a, a greater overall night of sleep. This is the truth. So if you sleep and you have like your thermostat down in the 60s, a couple of things. Number one, you sleep better. Two, it d- there is evidence that that triggers like mitochondria to increase, which is important for like the ketogenic diet. Uh, and it increases brown fat, which makes you burn more fat, and that's important so that you can increase ketones. So I actually think that like actually sleeping in that cold could be very, very important. Yeah, I think there's a lot to be said about the extremes. I love studying like the extreme cold, extreme hot, and we'll probably talk about that a lot more in the yeah. near future. But I think a big takeaway from this is uh, – Blue light, blue light blocking glasses. Be careful at night. Like if you're not utilizing blue light blocking glasses, go get a pair Um, and or have a better nighttime routine. Turn off your TV. Make sure your screen. A lot of phones now are coming with the screens that block out a lot lot of that blue light. Me too. So I think it's a great thing to utilize. Optimize your sleep optimize your sleep habits like put a major focus on that because it it plays a large factor in overall health and uh one of the big things that my grandpa told me he goes and he goes one of the things that you always want to invest in he goes it doesn't matter at any point in your life he goes invest in a good bed so we have we i think we have the same have bed the same, yeah, we, the same bed the same. that goes like this zero gravity and yeah. i'm like this is going to be an investment but think about it you spend a large majority of your life in bed sleeping at some capacity. So invest in that. Invest in your nighttime habits. Make sure you're optimizing them to the best of your ability. And so what would be your top three or five tips for people to take away from today's episode to make sure that they have a better night's sleep? Well, like you said, number one um, is have blackout curtains, blue light blocking glasses are very, very important. Try and do things that aren't super exciting, you know, like as far as like maybe watching stuff with, you know, battle scenes and stuff right before bed. If you're trying to get a good night's sleep, you know what I mean? Um, you know, if that's the goal, I would say, um, understand the importance of sleep is a tip in itself. Um, I'm a, I'm a body composition guy. I've seen studies where people have lost five pounds with high amounts of sleep versus five pounds with low amounts of sleep and the low amounts of sleep, they lost almost all muscle. So if your goal is body composition, you really need to make sure you're sleeping better. If your goal is to be keto adapted, you really need to be making sure you're sleeping better. Have a good quiet environment. You know, set it up so that um, you don't have things blinking in your room like lights. I think that's very important. So those, I would say, are my main primary main t- tips. And, of course, there's other ones like taking zinc and magnesium before bed. I think it would be very beneficial as well. I love it, brother. So, guys, optimize your sleep, optimize your health. I hope you had an incredible time listening to The Muscle PhD, my brother, um, on this week's episodes of What the Fat. You're definitely going to be on. You'll definitely be hearing a lot more from him in the near future. So I appreciate it if you guys can. Like, share, let everyone know. If you know someone that needs to optimize their sleep or deal with haters or trying to figure out how to gain (laughs) muscle on a ketogenic diet, share with them everything you learned uh, from this week. I appreciate it, brother. Thanks a lot, man. Appreciate it, man. We'll talk to you guys soon. Thank you. you.